so uh, I hope everybody well, okay, it's two people still don't have a seat anyway. So, yeah, maybe, maybe it's some of this. Anyway, so I just want to, to thank, I mean, first of all, the organizers of this workshop. I mean, just visit this uh, particular lecture and uh, uh, also, I mean, Shannon for this invitation to Bonn and I sort of really enjoy my time. And uh, these are these uh, Lipschitz lectures, which, uh, according to what I was told, uh, sort of is sort of slightly more extended. So we actually have uh, four dates. I mean, so it's always the same time, but here there is sort of one date missing because of uh, Princeton. And uh, uh, the program is, is uh, sort of what is more or less indicated uh, in the title already. I mean, so, so I want to talk sort of a little bit more generally about sort of macroscopic limits and large scale behavior of the system of many particles. But uh, uh, sort of more specifically, there will be sort of uh, like uh, roughly uh, two hours um, linked uh, to particles. So this is really kinetic theory, the issue of microscopic derivation of the Boltzmann equation. And then uh, that's sort of somehow what is in this title. I mean, it sort of uh, should indicate that uh, once you look from the wide frame, uh, you know, the, the idea of a kinetic is extremely general. I mean, people do kinetic limits for all kinds of things. But there is sort of a specific structure behind it. And if you sort of learn sort of, you know, the, the general sort of kinetic theory, but what you see from the textbook, maybe this is not so much emphasized because you're having sort of, you know, maybe a low density gas in your mind, and then you use particular methods which are specific for that low density gas. But, and this is why I wanted to put both. I mean, I want to tell you that once I go from particle to weight, which of course is a very different mathematical structure, you know, the idea which is behind the kinetic limit is actually completely identical. Okay, so you just have to know what the invariant <coughs> method of the free dynamics is. This doesn't mean very much to most people, but you know, at the end of my lectures, I hope you will understand what I'm trying to say. Okay, now uh, I was sort of uh, uh, in this somewhat difficult task. You see, I mean, many of, of these topics are sort of uh, you know very much up to current research, and, and uh, uh, lots of interesting uh, things going on. And then uh, you know, I hardly can keep up with the new results which are sort of uh, coming along. And, and uh, so I thought it would be a good idea. To sort of demonstrate that that uh, you know actually you know th there's much more than, than I'm able to, to tell you here, and uh, therefore I asked Sergio. I mean, he was sort of standing or sitting somewhere in the back here. Anyway, I asked Sergio Simonella, who you know has been working. I mean, with the postdoc with me for many years, and uh, well, traditionally with Mario Pogliarenti. And uh, anyway, so he worked on the kinetic theory, and I sort of wanted to give him sort of uh, in the last lecture sort of a little bit of an overview of what has happened, so to speak, and that interesting happened in the last five years or so. I mean, just to give you a feeling that, you know, it's an ongoing sort of enterprise and, and um, what I'm trying to tell you is sort of more like an uh, introduction and of course at some points I can go a little bit more deeply, but uh, it's supposed to be, uh, you know, a reasonably uh, a general set of lectures. And so let me let me start with, uh, with uh, my attempt. First item, which, which sort of is yet uh, not anything about kinetic limit, but sort of the motivation why we actually want to do kinetic limits. And I, I call this uh, a mathematical, uh, mathematical puzzle uh, from non equilibrium. Now, what I mean by non equilibrium is uh, non equilibrium statistical mechanics. I mean, this uh, should simply tell you that I'm looking at a system of many particles. <coughs> This is sort of what statistical mechanics is all about. And non equilibrium means that uh, things are moving in time, and therefore, sort of, I want to know something about the time behavior. Okay? And, and, and the example which, we, which I want to pick is sort of, uh, I mean, this is why I put a real puzzle on I mean, it. You know, it's something which is uh, totally unresolved, and we don't really have a mathematical answer, and, and so this is why I can still call it a puzzle. Otherwise, you know, I would have to put here a theorem or so, but, the, but this is not what I'm doing. Okay? And, um, and, and so let me, let me just uh, look at, uh, at um, what, what people call a simple fluid. Uh, um, simple refers to the fact that, you know, if you think of water or so, I mean, it, it, that's not a simple fluid. I mean, you know, the water molecules are H, H2O uh, and then sort of, you know, sort of uh, somewhat complicated. Uh, they're not, not necessarily completely symmetric, symmetric etc. They're also quantum, I mean, but simple fluid is sort of a fairly decent model and certainly, you know, as, as a theoretical toy model, it's extremely popular and, and, and extremely helpful. And so what you have is sort of like, I mean, you have positions, QJ and momenta RJ, so these are all vectors in R3, so I'm working here in physical space. And, um, and uh, well, I mean, then, then you have um, uh, maybe an, 
I have a small place in the action potential. Uh, so this is very symmetric, so which I call here V. I mean, short range space basically means that this function uh, on R3 has a, has a compact support, and so there's an interaction uh, between particles only at the sort of uh, closer than, than certain minimum distance, and then you can write down your Newton's equation of motion. So if you look at the evolution, the, so I'm, I, I, I'm sort of, my mass is one eventually, I mean, so I'm, I'm sort of, sometimes it's useful to have different symbols, I mean, so, so uh, you know, when I talk about momentum, uh, it's sort of the same thing as velocity anyway, so the time derivative of the position is, uh, and then I can look at the time derivative of the momentum, uh, and uh, of course, as you all know, I mean, then I have to sum over all the forces, which is minus the gradient of the potential. So that's uh, the gradient of this potential here. And uh, the I goes over all other particles, uh, 1 up to n. And the I will be different from J. And then I have the force uh, acting on QJ of the molecules centered at QI. Okay, so these are Newton's equation of motion. And um, um, uh, what we... I mean, okay, so, so this is sort of, uh, you know, if you want to sort of an atomistic model, atomistic or microscopic model. Okay. Now the puzzle is concerned with understanding, so uh, maybe I should say, okay, so, so here the, the J of course goes, goes from 1 all the way up to N, and of course the N is supposed to be very large. And the puzzle is to concern to understand what happens if I take now a large collection of particles, they all are governed by very precisely this kind of uh, differential equations, and you want to know what is sort of, you know, their behavior on large ones. And one very successful and, and uh, you know, in fact, uh, you know, very early discovered um, uh, set of equations are, uh, are the compressible Euler equations. Which I don't want to write down in full detail, actually. I just sort of want to give you sort of as a frame so that, you know, that I have a real equation in mind, so to speak, and not just of something completely checked out. And, uh, well, but Euler would say, well, and, you know, it's, it's, uh, I mean, he was asking, uh, Euler himself, of course, he was thinking uh, in a pure continuum language. I mean, he never specified, you know, any particles. But once we had Newton and, and we knew, people sort of became more and more convinced that there is an underlying microscopic structure. Then, of course, you know, the issue of, of how these things are related to the continuum equation, which I have just write down, um, uh, became uh, very crucial. And so, uh, so I'm, I'm writing down the compressible. So, so there will be, uh, so there will be a, a density field, there will be a velocity field, there will be an energy field. I'm dropping the energy field because I just want to sort of illustrate the equation. Okay. So here, uh, I mean, the, the, the directions of, of the of the carbon uh, is equal to zero. And then uh, I still have to write down the equation for the for the momentum. So I have ddt of rho times u alpha. Alpha are the three components. I mean, alpha goes from one, two, three. <coughs> okay. And uh, well, then there is uh, uh, the directions of um, uh, of uh, the rho, the u vector times u alpha. So that's the current, the momentum current. In the, of the alpha component, but then there's still another term, which is the pressure, which is uh, 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 a plus derivative with respect to the alpha's component of the pressure. And the pressure is itself a function of the density and of the in internal energy. And this has to be equal to zero, and then there will be an, an, an energy equation, which, which I'm not going to specify. Okay. All right, so what is the puzzle now? The, the puzzle is that, uh, so, and, you know, people make I mean, in our apartment, we have sort of these, these computer people, I mean, sort of, you know, from computer science people who sort of want to make uh, physically realistic movies. And they are producing, I mean, absolutely beautiful patterns of flowing fluids. I mean, it's just amazing structures which you see. And of course, what they do is, I mean, they just take this set of partial differential equations, they try to solve the mirror, and they do it with such a precision that you can see all these fine details. And then when you look at it, the puzzle is, how come that, you know, these simple particles which are governed by these equations ever approximate such a complicated system of uh, partial differential equations? 
And you can phrase it various ways, right? I mean, but, but, uh, but, but this is sort of the most amazing thing to me. I mean, that, that once you go to the microscopic picture, of course, you know, there, there will be a lot of noise. I mean, the idea that, you know, that sort of somehow a point wise approximation is certainly doesn't work very well. There will be a lot of noise, but nevertheless, I mean, you know, if, the, if you really, I mean, there, there are few beautiful computer simulations of particles, so <coughs> what people can do is sort of like, I don't know, like, like 10 to the 5 particles, 100,000 or so. And then you can see, you know, how well they can approximate equations. So, it's, and, and of course, you know, empirically, it's an extremely well-known fact that, that, you know, you take a real fluid, you know, I mean, real physical fluid, and of course it will be very well governed by the corresponding oil equations. But there are restrictions in it. So, so this is the next thing which I want to point out, because it sort of comes to one of the central themes of this introduction. I mean, so if you look at uh, the standard uh, phase diagram for such a fluid, you realize that there are lots of, lots of things uh, which can happen in the start changing the energy. So, uh, so here I have the pressure, and here I have the temperature, and then you have sort of a phase diagram which typically looks, looks like this. So here's the critical point, so here's gas, here you have the fluid, uh, and here you have a solid. And you see that these kind of equations are certainly not devised for, for, uh, for, uh, for uh, studying... Uh, uh -huh. I mean, they are certainly not devised for 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 uh, for you know studying a solid. I mean, if I take sufficiently low temperature in this system, it will describe a solid, right? I mean, clearly the Euler equations are not made for this. So, so I have to make sure that some of my initial conditions are sitting out here. They are deeply in the fluid machine, and then of course it becomes a real problem, you know, when you want to understand the interface between fluid and solid, etc., etc. So this is not what I want to go into. I just want to emphasize that you know you write down these equations but in the back of your mind it's clear that you have to restrict the kind of initial conditions you want to look at if i take initial conditions which uh, which uh, are somewhere down here then presumably you know these kind of equations are at least on uh, the first stage completely useless right okay so this this brings me to the so so okay so, so maybe i should write down the puzzle and so the puzzle is um um i mean you can phrase it differently by the particles uh, follow uh, the CD. Now, now you see there, there is, uh, I mean, you know, if you, if, you, if you are just sort of confronted with this problem, you realize after a short time that, you know, that, 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 that there cannot be a very simple answer. Why cannot there be a simple answer? Well, just look, look at these equations. Well, the density of particles, well, you know more or less, okay? I mean, and also what you mean by velocity, it's a mechanical quantity, so you know pretty well. But then you look at the pressure, and there's no pressure in this equation. So why, how come that suddenly this pressure appears? And so this means that, you know, whenever we are sort of really thinking about some sort of limit which produces these equations, I mean, you know, there must be some way of, you know, how this pressure, there must be an expression for the pressure, and you know, somehow must know how it comes out, right? And so this tells you that this is actually a very difficult problem. I'm not going to talk about it, but, but uh, since everybody is so familiar with fluids, I sort of want to use it as an illustration. So, you know, you can sort of feel what, what, you know, what would be sort of, you know, you know, I mean, feel why don't want to understand, you know, these kind of questions on a, on, a, on a mathematical level. Of course, on a physical level, you know, I mean, this is why I put here mathematical level. I mean, there, you know, there's a very, you know, very nicely, which you can read in the literature, argument, you know, what you have to assume in order to get these equations. Of course, physicists are all the time confronted with the situation that they have a complicated system, and, you know, they are sort of trying to get equations which maybe, you know, describe particular features and then maybe are useful. I mean, obviously, if you want to study fluids, if you wouldn't have fluid dynamic equations, I mean, you're totally lost, right? I mean, you would never, you would never attempt to go back to this kind of equation. I mean, it's just too complicated, right? I mean, so, so you, you know, you rather would like to sort of look at those things. And so, you know, there, there are many systems, you know, there are on all scales, there are sort of systems of this type, like galaxies, so you go down to sort of elementary particles, and there are always sort of these issues of, of how to go from, from one scale, one descriptive scale to another one, and how they are linked. So for physicists, it's sort of more, uh, you know, uh, sort of, uh, Daily bread, if you want to, but um, and they would presumably regard this as question, you know, which I'm posing here, it's not sort of as extremely interesting. On the other side, you know, since it's such a general phenomenon, I mean, it would be nice to have sort of at least a few mathematical showcases where this kind of transition can be understood. Okay, so now I want to sort of uh, say a few key elements which which uh, 
uh, which, which are always the case and which, uh, um, you know, uh, will be later on useful if you, if, you want, if you are going to talk about sort of low density gases and waves. I mean, so I just want to bring out this. And so, so, so the very first um, um, observation is that um, you need random initial conditions. You see, somehow I told you already <coughs> that uh, you know if I, if, if I would, would even attempt to derive these equations, I better make sure that I'm somewhere up in this phase diagram. By what I mean by this is that my initial state must have some similarity to the Gibbs state, which corresponds to these particular parameters, pressure uh, and temperature. And so automatically, I will have you know even if I even want to talk about this thing, automatically I will have random initial conditions. Okay. Now there's another example which, which sort of is um, the one which which which, which Boltzmann liked very much. I mean, you read his original articles. I mean, so let me just draw. I mean, I should draw a cube, but I mean, let me just draw a square here. And so he would say, well, okay. I mean, you know, we have to give you certain density and a certain number of particles. I mean, so that we are somehow in this fluid machine, or maybe in low density gas. But now let's sort of simply arrange these particles on the line. Of course, there will be many particles because now I squeeze. You know, sort of like like L square particles into a region of size L. I mean, so, so it will be high density, and then uh, you know I make all the velocities of pointing uh, along the one direction, and it's clear that this will just go on forever as a one-dimensional object. Now, it will be highly unstable if I make a small perturbation. Presumably, something is going to happen, right? But but it just tells you that, that there will be exceptions. So let me give you. I mean, the, this exceptions maybe you regard as as uh, sort of two 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 uh, sort of too construed, so to speak. And so, so let me tell you another example, which, which is actually uh, not so construed and, and on which we mathematically we just don't know anything. So uh, let me just imagine that, that I put my particles in a, in a regular lattice. OK, I put the square only because I can more easily draw this. And then uh, you know maybe we want to give sort of particles sort of maybe some random velocities. Okay? Then, then you would say, ah, you know, the energy I can adjust by, by, putting, by putting sufficiently Sort of uh, sufficiently kinetic energy here, and and, uh, and clearly on a macroscopic scale, I mean, you know, you would just see no <coughs> density. I mean, we would never discover that there's this underlying regular pattern. Questions: If I let it evolve according to this one, does it still follow such kind of equations? I mean, nobody knows. I don't know myself either. I just want to point out that it's sort of it's sort of intrinsic in this in this uh, mechanical systems which have a deterministic evolution that uh, there will be sort of exceptions. Another famous exception which. Uh, has been discussed a lot in the literature. This is uh, you know this, this issue of time reversal in the areas of the microscopic equations. I mean, this is of course an equation which is reversal under. Uh, I mean, it's invariant on time reversal. But if I add the Navier-Stokes, I mean, it wouldn't. And then uh, you know from this you can sort of construct similar kind of things. You just said this is a run for a certain while, and then, then maybe sort of approaches some particular action, sort of vice uh, approach some equilibrium state, and then at a particular moment I reverse the velocities. And then, of course, it will sort of just do the opposite, right? It will sort of move away from equilibrium. Now, you see that the idea of this example is not so much that, uh, you know, I can actually really, you know, re physically reverse the velocities. I mean, this, of course, you know, even on a computer, is hard. I mean, if you do it on a computer, you can see that, that for a little while, the system will actually reverse its history, but then eventually, sort of, the imprecision of the reversal will take over. So, uh, but, but the, the, the point is that it's a mathematical objection. You see, it, it tells you that, that if, if sort of, you know, if I reverse the velocities, you know, the, the, the macroscopic, what I see with my eyes, so to speak, you know, hasn't changed at all. Of course, I have reversed everywhere the velocities, but, 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 you know, I would not, I, would, I couldn't see that there are sort of very funny correlations between the particles, okay? And so it just tells you that there's another example how you can construct counterexamples to the idea that, you know, you, you could do something for, for somehow... You know, this kind of limit could be taken for all possible initial conditions, even you know within a certain range of parameters, like like you know, you must have a suitable energy and suitable density. So, so this, this is sort of a, a, a very important message, and in, in all of the kind of you know more mathematical work, of course, you know this is very much exploited, and then of course you you put in random initial conditions. So, of course, the question is asked now, you know, what kind of random initial conditions you should put, and the idea is sort of relatively simple. I mean, just try to put the maximum uh, randomness allowed by whatever you have uh, as initial information. Okay? And then if you are really able to prove a theorem, 
which is fine. For, for that sort of, you know, sort of some somehow maximal random initial state, but then you can still sort of, if you still have some strengths, you can still sit down and try to think what happens if I maybe now try to put less initial randomness and maybe the system, the, the proof still works. Okay? And so it's just sort of, you know, to have put this in, in, in a picture. I mean, if I imagine that I have, uh, if I know that, that, that my gas is sort of, uh, you know, somehow mostly occupied in this region and here everything is empty. Uh, you know, then the idea would be that as my initial measure, I just put sort of, sort of the corresponding Gibbs measure for that particular situation, or maybe just a Poisson measure with a uniform density over here, and no particle on this side. So this would be sort of the natural initial <coughs> measure according to which any probability statement which I'm going to sort of formulate, uh, it refers to, you know, whenever I talk to probability, it refers to that probability which I put in the initial condition. Okay, so this was number one. And now number two. Number two is another general thing which, which I think is it, sort of uh, uh, important and, uh, uh, well, uh, of course it's understood. I mean, I'm not, not the first thing to say this, but, but I just sort of want to emphasize that there are sort of two general points. I mean, the, the next thing what we do is we, we have a law of large numbers. Okay, so let me sort of travel on, on that point a little bit. Uh, let me see what, 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 what I wanted to say here. Yeah. Question, but you write large with a capital number with a small number. Law of large number, you will see. Yeah, yeah, no, no, that's right. Yeah, that's a good point. So, 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 so this tells already that I must have a setup, you know, which allows you for having a law of large numbers. Absolutely correct, yes. Okay, so let's, let's see whether we can do that. So, so to speak. Uh, because cleaning it with blackboard is uh, sort of a slight difficulty, so let me sort of be here a little bit. You can use the same the erasers. Well, but that, then it takes time to. I know, no, 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 I, I no, no, no. will have to use it. No, I mean, it I know, I know, I know. I know. <laughs> this, this I know very well, but, but uh, let me be a little bit stingy at that whole point here. Okay. All right, so, so, so what is the law of large numbers? Well, okay, so let's, let's, let, let's think about a concrete object. And, and so this is why, why I brought up this, this uh, example. Let's think about the velocity field. I mean, you know, that's something which sort of everybody understands how it's moving and there are particles <coughs> moving, and so you sort of know what you mean by the velocity field. But now I want to think of, so, so there's no dynamics. I mean, so it's a law of a static law of large numbers. Okay, the, the dynamical law of large numbers is a more complicated story, and, and I will not enter into this, uh, but only very, very little. But, but I want to sort of start at the moment at time to So I have particles with, you know, with position and momentum, but, but there's no dynamics at that moment. So, so what, what, what do I mean by, by, the, by the velocity field? Well, so let, let's write down what I call the empirical. So the problem is, of course, know this terminology very well, but I mean, let me just sort of use this here also, the empirical velocity field. So empirical just means that I'm taking a velocity field associated to a given microscopic configuration, right? And, and the way how you do this is that it's very easy, so, so that's u of x is equal, well, you know, I take the sum, whatever, you know, 1 over n, which is a very large n, and then I look at, at the, the position, uh, maybe I want to put it like this, it doesn't make any difference anymore, I want to look at the position of the quality, but now what I want to measure here is the corresponding velocity, so here I put my velocity, okay? So this is now a random field, because, because the q's and the p's are random, and then u of x is sort of has basically the meaning of the velocity field. Okay. All right. Now the idea is that so, so this comes you know having having sort of uh, lots of particles. Now I want to sort of impose a little data which have a slow variation. Well, somehow it's, it's clear what, what what I mean. You know, I mean I have some smooth function over here, and then of course I have lots of lots of particles which sort of can approximate this sort of function, but what I want to ensure is that uh, you know, this function is slowly varying on the scale of the typical interparticle distance. Okay? And so in order to do this, of course, I need sort of lots of particles, so maybe uh, you know, if I want to take this one, maybe I, I want to take this distance here of order epsilon to the minor minus one, so that's sort of, sort of a dimensional scale parameter, which just tells me you know, what, is, what is the ratio between two length scales. I mean, this, scale on which the, the, the macroscopic profile is varying and then the distance between the particles. Okay, and uh, well, I mean, now, 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 now of course, uh, what we have uh, to do is, I mean, we, we cannot 
We cannot have a, a single initial measure, but we must have a sequence of initial measures, right? I mean, so we have a sequence of initial measures, uh, which are not specified precisely of initial measures. And let me call them new epsilon, to sort of remember that uh, they depend on epsilon. And, and, and uh, you know, they are, of course, uh, very specific chosen in order to sort of reproduce that particular situation. Okay. Well, and then uh, what, 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 what is the object which you want to look at, which is sort of this law of large numbers? Well, I just sort of take my velocity field u of x. Of course, the u of x is a highly fluctuating quantity because, you know, as I go to the next, I will see sort of a different particle which has a different velocity, so this will be a highly fluctuating quantity. But now I do what, what, uh, what uh, sort of uh, everybody would do. I mean, you just uh, smoothen this uh, over a large region, but, you know, the, the, the region is somehow associated to the kind of macroscopic resolution which I still want to see. And so, uh, so this is this VA, so <coughs> I have here. <coughs> so, so, I mean, the way I put the units is that, that I think that the typical distance between particles is equal to one, right? I'm actually sort of, okay, and then, 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 then I take uh, here my, my velocity field, U of X, uh, and then uh, I want to normalize this, so I put here an epsilon group, and so, you know, when I integrate it over this function, I mean, it's social integral will be equal to one. So phi is a positive function, uh, that's a smooth compact support, okay? And of course, I can also write this sort of like epsilon to the cube, the summation over all J, uh, and uh, and then I have here uh, the phi of epsilon uh, to j, and I have to j, and then there's an epsilon to the power. Okay, I put the epsilon to the power the other side, okay? So, so, so the new epsilon... Then so now, I'm sorry, I mean, I, I, I put here something sort of... Uh, this was confusing, okay? So so I have I have this, this, uh, this uh, microscopic uh, random velocity field, and uh, now I put a sequence of measure in such a way I have this low variation. And then the, the quantity which I want to look at is actually sort of this particular quantity. Okay? So what is the relation? Mm -hmm. the, there's no relation between new epsilon and the other thing you want to do. What was that? I don't, and it's nothing is relating new epsilon to anything else. No, no, I mean... It says new epsilon and then you write something with I have, Okay, so, so, now, so now, 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 okay, so, so, so let's see what I want to say. Um, okay, now, now what I mean is the law of large numbers, I'm, I'm not proving this <laughs> law of large numbers, it's, it's an assumption on my initial data, okay? So, so uh, maybe I didn't phrase this other too nicely. So, so what I want to say is that, you know, you have a lot of freedom of putting your initial measure, but there's one very important constraint which you can sort of note empirically. If I start, you know, a fluid with, with some sort of microscopic configuration, I let it move. And then I, I take another sort of uh, uh, initial condition, which, which sort of looks more or less the same as on the macroscopic scale, sort of more or less the same. I will see the same motion. And, and in order to, and this is sort of a completely generic feature of, of any kind of macroscopic <coughs> sort of large scale display. And so, what I want to impose is that I want to, I want, so, so I define this microscopic velocity field, and I want to impose a law of large numbers which sort of reflects this sort of empirical property. Okay. And so what, 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 what I want to impose here is that, that uh, uh, this converges to a limit as epsilon going to zero. So that is an assumption of sort of ex explaining what I mean by this law of large numbers. And this conversion should be almost surely. And uh, it will converge to a definite limit. And so the definite limit is the integral of t phi phi over x. So it's just a reconvergence of this object. And then, uh, you know, this is sort of per particle, and I want to, I'm, the way I'm doing this is per volume, so typically I have to put here the density, and then I have to put here uh, my, 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 my velocity field, I mean, so. Okay, so, so uh, maybe I didn't say this so nicely, but, but what I want to say is that in any one of these problems, what you, what, what you assume is you, you, you're, you're, it's not only that the number of particles is large, but you also assume that your initial uh, conditions are made in such a way that almost surely they converge to the macroscopic profile. But, but still, I mean, I, I, so I, I take it that new epsilon is the law of initial distribution of the Qs and Ts. That's correct. Okay. And now then there should be a relation between N and epsilon. No, no. So I, okay, okay. Let, 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 let me so, it read, read it uh, backwards. I first pick myself what I mean by a macroscopic profile. So I give you some smooth function u of x, and I give you some density yeah. function u of x. 
Okay, now I want to approximate this Pauli configuration. Right. And, and the way how this is done in any of these microscopic limits is that <coughs> I pick a sequence of measures. Yeah. But still, the n has to be here somehow. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. Well, the, n is also, the n is also random. I mean, so n, n is, you know. Shouldn't n some of those be Yeah, I mean, uh, okay, yeah, sure, sure. The n will be connected to epsilon. Yeah, that, that depends on which specific limit I'm going to look at, right? I mean, so. It should be to that. Yeah, yeah. So no, it has to be to that. Otherwise, otherwise, otherwise there's 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 so maybe you should end up saying. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. Yeah, no, that's okay. Okay, so let's see. So, so, so let, let, let me give an example so that so it becomes, becomes very clear what, what I want to say. So, so here's an example. Uh, so, I mean, I take this collection of Q traits. I take this to be Poisson. And I take a, a density. So this is infinite space. Now I take a density which is, let's say, uh, larger than zero. <coughs> and, uh, okay, and then, uh, and, and, and the P-trace uh, I take to be uh, uh, independent. I take it to be Gauss, let's say, and I take uh, the variance of the P-trace should be equal to one, let's say, but now the object which is slowly varying is sort of, I want to impose a velocity <coughs> here, the object which is slowly varying is that I assume that the expected value of the, uh, of the mean of these objects is given by um, uh, a slowly varying function, which depends, you know, at what particular position this particle is sitting on. So this will be u epsilon of future. Okay? So this would be one particular example, and then, then you can convince yourself that uh, uh, if you now plug this in, I mean, then uh, you know you will get. So this would be sort of a sort of typical example how you construct this. And so when you when, when you put it in here, I mean, you can convince yourself that you can do prove a law of large numbers exactly of the form which I have written. Okay, so the rho would be constant, and the u of x, of course, is the is sort of you know the variation in, in, in the initial velocities with which which I put into my machine. So here, 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 you know, I, I, since I'm working in infinite space, so n is already <coughs> at the beginning is sort of infinity, but you can also cut it down to a finite volume. I mean, then in, but, but n would be, you know, a random variable in this case. Okay, so now what, what is the general goal um, of such kind of, uh, of such kind of microscopic description? It's the following. So, um, uh, so, so I want, so, so the generic goal is the following. So, and so I'm still sticking to this one example here. Um, so, so now, of course, I can look at my velocity field, I mean, the empirical field, I mean, up there. So that, that's this u of x, okay? And I can uh, uh, put here a time, and, well, I mean, the time is, is, is very easy, right? I mean, I just have to sort of solve Newton's equation of motion and plug it into the definition. So this will be, again, the summation of j into 1 up to n, let's say, and then I have delta of x minus qj times t. And then I have to feature it here. And these are now uh, evolving according to, uh, to uh, you know, th these are computed according to the solution of the microscopic equation. Now, the hope would be that, uh, and that's of course is very difficult and nobody knows how to prove it in this particular context, the hope would be that this kind of time evolved object would still satisfy large, of num large numbers. So that's, that's sort of issue number one. But then the question is, you see, it's an infinite dimensional law of large numbers. I mean, so the question is, uh, what happens to, you know, so to speak, the label of, 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 of that <coughs> law of large numbers? What happens to the macroscopic velocity field? Well, then, then the assertion would be that uh, if I take here the appropriate time scale, okay, so this is now, of course, I mean, I should put here a question mark, I mean, but this is what, 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 what you would hope, right? I mean, so there, there are still, so there's still an almost sure limit, and uh, and uh, it would go to some u of x of t and rho of x of t. Right? I mean, so this would be the data which I have to put in here when I start integrating over test function. This would be the data which I would have to put in over here. So the first assertion is that there is a lot of large numbers, and then the second assertion would be that that these new data I can compute by solving a particular PD. Uh, let's say in our case the Euler equations. Right? I mean, so these are sort of 
So, so you, you put you, you, you make strong assumptions on your initial data so that you have a law of large numbers. So you know when, when you look on a microscopic scale, you will see one very specific profile. And then uh, the hope would be that if you sort of start with such an issue condition, and of course, the, you know, this evolution, of course, you know, it, it's, it's formally well defined, but it, it's sort of in principle rather complicated. But anyway, I mean, you hope that there's still a law of large numbers, and uh, that the data and this law of large numbers you can actually compute. Now, this is not doable, and I should mention, I mean, in the sense that, that you know, just, just uh, you know, everybody agrees that, that, you know, it's not even a millennium problem. I mean, it's just sort of something which we should, nobody has any, any idea how to do it. But I should mention that there's sort of one result which I think actually is, is quite spectacular. It, it's already quite some time back, but, but um, uh, you know, these people actually really try to um, try to, to tackle this question and, and in some sense sort of, you know, uh, tried as much as you could do. Uh, let's see, I guess I missed. <coughs> uh, Okay, no, okay, I don't think I did. I think that's good. I think that they have that. That's what they do. Now, now, they actually prove, uh, at least for short times, uh, you know, the validity of, of, um, of, uh, um, of uh, the Euler equations, of the compressible Euler equations, which is the one which I had up here. Now, this is uh, sort of some time back, I mean, 1993. And uh, they somehow understood what is what is the mechanism, you know, behind having this uh, law of large numbers and having, you know, these updates of, of the of the parameters which enter into the law of large numbers. But uh, you know, to do this at the level of of, uh, of, of the uh, sort of correct microscopic equation is, as I said, sort of you know, I mean, it's really not doable. Um, so, but what, what they did is they said, well, look, I mean, you know, this interaction between particles they sort of look almost stochastic. And so what they did is they sort of replaced the deterministic interaction between particles sort of with stochastic interactions, which is presumably not, not such a bad idea. And, and, but, and this stochastic interaction is sort of working on a scale which is much, much smaller than, than the scale of the Euler equation. Right? <coughs> so it's, it's starts and it's still many particles are sort of doing this stochastic interaction. But uh, when I go to the macroscopic scale, I will see no difference. And so this is the best which one can do, and therefore uh, uh, the motivation is to look at uh, somewhat easier problems, and this is sort of uh, what is up here. So, so what I want to do is sort of explain you the kinetic limit in this language. And uh, uh, what is the advantage of the kinetic limit? Well, the advantage of the kinetic limit is that it has sort of intrinsically a small parameter, which, which here, you see here, in some sense, the only small parameter is sort of the slow variation, but, but otherwise there's no real sort of natural small parameter. And slow variation is only a, a parameter in initial conditions, not even in your in your evolution equation. So so you know that makes it very hard. Now the kinetic limit, as you will see in a second, has the advantage that, that uh, you have a small parameter. I mean either the density or let's say the strength of the interaction, and therefore you know this kind of picture, at least sort of in particular cases, which I'm going to discuss uh, in more detail, uh, can be actually verified. Yeah. All right, so this is a good moment to ask any question. Uh, I spent already an enormous amount of time, but anyway, I mean, that's very so useful. And so let me, unless there are sort of questions, let me go to the chapter one, which is the appearances. Um, and uh, as I said, I mean, the goal is to present it in such a way that, that uh, maybe I will not emphasize this by the moment, but so sort of that's always in the back of my mind. I mean, to sort of explain you the story in such a way that you can sort of very easily see the correspondence to waves. I mean, but, uh, but this is going to come. So, okay. so that's Mr. Yes. For questions, you know. Yes. Go so ahead. you yes. are having categorically that this mm -hmm. is not doable. Yes. So can I understand, you know, without really trying to do it, that it's why it's so hard? And why is it oh, why oh, so hard? Okay, well, the, this, 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 of course, yeah, the, this I can explain. You. Why is it so hard? Well, you see, the, 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 the way how you how you try to approach this problem is to say, okay, okay, so maybe maybe, maybe I should, okay, uh, okay, so then I have to say a few words. I mean, the first, the first question is sort of I, I sort of suggested to you that uh, you know the time t is in sort of order one. Now, yeah, of course, I can take the time take time t order one, but then the microscopic fields are not moving at all, right? So this may be something you can prove. 
But you know, it's, it's not, not not such a terribly interesting result, right? I mean, even this yes. even this might be not, not totally easy, right? I'm I'm not saying that it can be done, but but uh, but uh, really the real problem is that you want to adjust of uh, the time scale to the spatial scale. Now you see the the, the spatial scale are epsilon to the minus one here. That that's sort of my picture up there, and then you look at your limiting equation and you see that they are sort of. Uh, you know, it's realistic. I mean, you know, space and time sort of appear exactly on the same order. You have time derivatives, CDT, and you have spatial derivatives. So it's rather natural that, 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 that uh, what you want to take is you want to take time in microscopic units is epsilon to the minus 1t. Yeah. So, so this means that, that, that you don't only have many particles, but you also have to, in order to see something, you also have to evolve over a rather long time. Okay? So now, now what, what is the strategy what, what you're trying to prove? I mean, the, the strategy, or what, they, what these people are trying to prove, the strategy is roughly the following. Let's say, okay, let's, let, let's look at this very long time. And, and uh, you know, we, 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 we start the system already with the state of maximal uh, entropy, maximal randomness. So the initial state will be sort of, uh, sort of what people call a local equilibrium state. I mean, a state which, which uh, you know, where, where you, you put things as a Gibbs measure, but, but the parameters in the Gibbs measure, they sort of, you know, have this low variation uh, as indicated up there. I mean, they are sort of, I mean, let's say the temperature has a slow variation and, and the, the mean velocity, and so, so, so it's sort of locally, it looks like a homogeneous Gibbs measure, but then I look at the large kinetics, uh, is a large uh, uh, Euler scale, I mean, the way how we want to do the decide dynamic limit, and then, uh, uh, you would have to, to um, have put this slow variation into the initial measure. Now, what you, uh, so the characteristic of this initial measure is that when you look locally, it's actually invariant, it's stationary under the dynamics. And now the strategy is to let this sort of run for a long time, and then somehow try to prove that what you're going to see locally, you know, maybe could be still a superposition of, of equilibrium states, but what you're going to see will be sort of a convex combination of equilibrium measures. Okay? Now, <coughs> proof this on the level of deterministic dynamics, I mean, there's simply no good tools. I mean, you know, you need whatever chaotic behavior, or, uh, you know, things which, which, which are not developed to, to look at, uh, which of course, you know, lots of people make beautiful contributions, but they're not developed to deal with such a complicated system. Now, when you do a stochastic system, then you have sort of a better control of convergence to equilibrium, and this is what they are exploiting. Okay? All right, so uh, is that good enough? Yeah. Okay. okay, so now, now I want to do the, the kinetic scaling. <coughs> so, uh, uh, so now things become sort of a little bit more concrete, and so, so, so I will have uh, so I will look at some box which I call lambda, which is an R3. And uh, I imagine, uh, so, so this, this is already on the kinetic scale. I mean, of course, you could start uh, on, a, on a box on a microscopic scale, then it would be very huge. But uh, for the kind of limit, you see, sort of the idea that you have a sequence of numbers, and then uh, you know you, you want to sort of look over it uh, on a scale where this sequence of numbers converges to some finite limit, and that's the same thing over here. So this is a kinetic scale, right? So I will have lots, lots of atoms in here. Okay, now, now uh, I take uh, in hard spheres. And later on, and uh, actually, and they'll be random. I mean, so uh, in half spheres, and they have a diameter uh, epsilon times a. So, so this sort of fixes my epsilon. I mean, a is I put here the a because you know it's a bi-dimensional. I mean, so, so this um, you know the, the ratio of, of the atomic distance and then this length this would be epsilon. Okay, so I have a diameter epsilon a. And um, uh, so it's going to be a small parameter, which will be very, very small. And uh, end of the random. Uh, so this morning, morning uh, you know, Mario was giving a very nice talk about uh, similar kind of things. I mean, he sort of uh, likes to take n fixed, I mean, which is fine. I mean, you can take also n fixed. But, you know, in the spirit of putting maximum randomness, I mean, it's, uh, I mean so form <coughs> simplifies a little bit if you put it random. Okay. It's not, 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 not <coughs> Okay, and now, but, but uh, so, I mean, uh, as Anton pointed out, I mean, the expected value of n sort of uh, would have to go to infinity, otherwise, I mean, we don't have any microscopic any kinetic limit. Um, and uh, the next important input is that we want to say that the velocities 
you see, you could also do something with the velocity. I mean, maybe people want to look at, I mean, you know, it depends what kind of physical situation what you want to do, but in kinetic theory, the velocities are always considered to be all of one. Okay. I mean, these objects are small, but, but uh, you know, their velocities is sort of all of one. And now we, we want to, what, what, what <coughs> I was asking, I mean, we want to connect uh, in an epsilon. And, uh, and the way we want to do that is, is quite simple. Um, so here I have a little, a little sphere. I mean, this something would be, would be epsilon a. And then I have sort of what is the collision volume. So this is the mean free pass. So that's sort of, this particle is traveling until it sort of hits another particle, maybe over here. So maybe I should indicate this is a different color. Mm. Of course, this, this could be, you know, either, either a little bit earlier or a little bit later, but so mean free pass. So the average value when you hit this uh, particle. And so let's give a rough estimate of what the mean free pass would be. Well, I mean, you, 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 take, you take this collision volume, which is epsilon a squared. It's just the volume of this cylinder, and then <coughs> uh, L. And then somehow you would think, you know, that these collision uh, cylinders should fill uh, the entire box. So, so you simply, you have n particles, so you multiply this by n, and then you put this equal to them. So then there's just the volume of the box. Okay. And, and now you have to sort of uh, convince yourself that that's sort of a reasonable thing. I mean, so, so this means that, that, that the way I want to, I want to, uh, the way how they, the, the number of particles should increase is sort of, uh, should go like epsilon to the minus two. This is sort of what comes from this. And uh, now, now the question is, is this really a low density? Well, yes, I mean, because uh, when I look at the volume, uh, I mean, the volume occupied um, by the spheres, I mean, then, you know, one, one of them will have, uh, then I have a volume epsilon cube, and then I have n of them, so this is epsilon to the minus two, and this is equal epsilon, and this this uh, certainly will go to zero. So eventually, the volume occupied by spheres uh, is to zero. But if you so so you might think it's just going to go to non-interacting particles. But if you look sort of you know on, on uh, if you if you look at on time scale one, I mean you see that there are lots of collisions in the system, and so there's actually still some non-trivial dynamics going on. So, um, uh, okay. Okay, so, so in particular, I mean, you know, if, I mean, I, I arrange my things in such a way, I'm working on the kinetic scale, and you have velocities of order one. This means sort of, you know, when I look at the, the number of collisions, or so, so if I specify one particular particle, and if I look at, at its path, its typical path, so if I maybe look at one sphere over here, and then, uh, you know, I see how it will sort of move like this. Then, uh, you know, if I look at the finite kinetic time, it will have sort of typically a finite number of collisions. Right? And so this is sort of, sort of obviously, you know, a much simplified, uh, much more simplified than, than looking at, at the finite density situation. Okay, and now maybe one thing which, which I want to still uh, explain here, because uh, this is sort of going to be important <coughs> later on, is that uh, what I could do is I could, um, I could, um, so let, let, let's, let's assume that we have arranged in such a way, and then now what I could do is I could sort of maybe, um, maybe I'm going here. So here I look at my box. Okay, now, now, now what I want to assume is that, that uh, you know, uh, let's see which way we want to do that. Uh, now, okay, so this is coming next, but, 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 but let, me, let me sort of do this first here. Okay, so I can look at this, this, um, at, at this box here and, uh, and maybe specify a particular point in the box which I call X here. Okay? And uh, now I could ask myself, um, what, uh, you know, in, in, in this kinetic limit, uh, what, is what is the statistic of the particles very close to this microscopic point? Now, the way how I want to do so, I, I put a little ball here around this, so, so, so let me call this a ball B lambda of X. X is here a fixed point, and lambda is the vagus. And so you see, when you when you when you ask yourself that the number of particles should be finite in this box, and sort of just goes through this algebra, how the number of particles increases, I mean, you see that uh, I have to take the lambda equal to epsilon to the two thirds. Okay, so if I make it small, I mean, epsilon goes to zero, it will be small, but it will not go to to zero too quickly. So I will see a finite number of particles in this box. Okay, and then then you see that this, of course, is still much much larger than the typical distance. So even on that scale. 
uh, you know, this will become point particles. And so you can ask yourself, what, what, what will be, what will be so the statistics of the particles that I'm going to look at a, in, in such a small box? And now comes an important message. I mean, the important message is that, you see, in, in such a small box, I mean, you can, I can sort of forget more or less about all the interactions. I mean, these particles are just sort of uh, uh, just moving without any interaction whatsoever. And then, and this is sort of, uh, sort of comes simply because you know the velocities are of order one, and whatever kind of correlations they have, they sort of are happy to transport this away. Uh, what happens is that the system has a very strong tendency to establish one of the stationary measures of the non-interacting system. And in very concretely, this means that what I'm going to see is uh, is uh, is a Poisson process, uh, Poisson point process. I guess that's what people call it. Okay. And uh, with parameters which I'm going to explain in a second, a little bit more clearly, but, but uh, the thing which I want to emphasize is that because, you see, I'm looking at such a small box that, that uh, I still do not detect any kind of macroscopic variation. So in fact, you know, this Poisson point process will be infinitely extended. I am number of particles goes to infinity, the number of particles in this box, if I make it sort of large, will also go to infinity. And so I will see a spatially homogeneous Poisson point process. Okay, I will give a few words below, but what I just want to emphasize is that that uh, you know that there's always sort of a probabilistic picture of what happens at the various scales, and then the, the, the most elementary in all these kinetic theory models is that that on, on a local scale you see the invariant measures of the sort of you know, the integrable theory, which which uh, I mean of the sort of non-interactive scales. Okay, let's see. Okay, so so maybe maybe uh, what, what would be the local Poisson which, which which I want to have here? So um, maybe I should write down some formulas. So first of all, there will be a local density rho. I mean, so I'm leaving off the x. I mean, I'm sort of looking at one fixed x. But uh, but but then there should be also uh, then there should be also the the the, the pi. Okay, so 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 the, the q will have an intensity uh, will have an intensity or density which is given by the rho. But then I have also the momentum and they will be IID according to some distribution, uh, which maybe so, which is joint distribution, uh, which I maybe I call H of V. <laughs> and then uh, what is common in kinetic theory is sort of uh, sorry, this is a density row. And what is common in, in kinetic theory is that you know this information sort of you don't really want to separate it so. so in such a way, I mean, you just want to write down uh, the Boltzmann function, which is the function of V at that point, which is simply uh, um, okay. uh, uh, which is a function of, of, of uh, okay. maybe write down immediately. So, so, so we have the Boltzmann function. I mean, it's just sort of a convenient way to, to label these things. Um, okay, so, so this is an which sort of contains all this information, and first it will be spatially dependent, <coughs> and it will depend on v. Okay, so this 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 labels the point. Uh, lambda. Okay. Well, then there will be a density, which which I get from the normalization. So if I take uh, f of uh, x v dv, I mean this gives me the local density rho of x. Right? And then uh, if I look at, at one over rho of x f of x of v, this gives me sort of this information here, right? I mean, so the point is that, that this, this f function false one um, has a macroscopic meaning, which I'm going to explain in a second. But already now I wanted to emphasize that, that once you give me this, this Boltzmann f function behind this, there's also definite local statistics of particles. And, uh, you know, when we come to waves, then uh, the situation will be sort of slightly different. Because, uh, you know, then, then Poisson has disappeared. I mean, you know, waves uh, I mean, have nothing to do with Poisson. But, you know, what should not be so surprising that if I start off with waves, I mean, then the national variant measures are Gaussian measures. And so, so the analogy is that, that if I come to waves, I mean, whenever I see Poisson, I basically have to replace it by Gauss. I'm just running faster than I thought. So let's see. So, um, uh, okay. So, uh, no, I, I don't want to do two overall. So, so I just have to continue there next time. 
And um, uh, actually, it's a good, uh, good uh, moment uh, to interrupt my lazy explanations. Is that correct? Oh, no, I still have no, I still have half an hour. Oh, no, 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 no. Okay, good. Uh, so, so uh, I was worried that, that I was sort of starting over time. So, so yeah, sorry. I mean, Sorry. <laughs> okay, now I can use maybe, but uh, nevertheless I can use, use now this, uh, this beautiful uh, invention here. And, uh, and, uh, uh, <coughs> yeah, so it took me a little bit. Space. Hmm. I, I guess I gave this a name, I mean, so this is my Fox Lambda, and then I have the velocity space, which is on screen. And um, so then, then, uh, then I have a Fox Map function. So this is sort of, if you want to sort of like, like uh, uh, the density, so, so uh, it's, it's that quantity which appears when I, in the kinetic limit, correctly write down the law of large numbers. Okay, and so uh, uh, when I look at some little volume, and of the three, and I integrate over that volume, and um, uh, uh, if, uh, I take this with n and maybe a time t, and then uh, this would be the number of particles in my little region delta, which is a subset of this omega. Right? Okay. So, uh, 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 so I mean, you know, this this uh, Boltzmann f function it sort of looks like like an expelled in the velocity space and it's sort of at least mentally, I mean, sort of bound in the next space, right? I mean, so this is sort of easy, easy to do. <coughs> and now, now we would like to sort of compute what is what is the change of time, change in time of that quantity. Um, I have to assume that, that uh, I mean, uh, okay, I, I guess, uh, okay, I'm, I'm ignoring sort of the fact that, that the lambda is a finite box, I mean, so let, let's simply assume that uh, I'm working on infinite space, and so there will be one contribution which is sort of the obvious one, you have the free streaming part. So, you know, when, when I ask myself, you know, how, I, how is this number changing, then of course, you know, it, I mean, they are moved according to the intrinsic velocity, and uh, if you write this sort of in a differential form, then uh, we get minus uh, v. So, so now I actually I'm, I'm switching. Let's see. I'm, I'm, uh, okay. So, so actually I will. So I will. I will use. Um, sorry. Um, so I will use uh, j instead, instead of. Okay. So here the velocity, then there is sort of the gradient with respect to. Uh, X and then I function. Okay, so this is sort of one change, and then of course there's a second change, 
uh, in the pursuit of the collisions. And now, so I'm, I'm sort of presenting this, maybe not, not in the way how you would read it in the textbook, but uh, sort of the way I sort of think it's sort of most intuitive. So, uh, so you want to write down something about the collision. So now, now the first idea about the collision is that since our particles are so very small, that uh, you know the, the collisions is sort of you know a very local event. And so, so what I'm doing is I'm just writing down the rate equation. So I'm looking at DDT of my Boltzmann A function here times t. And now in, in the notation, I'm going to suppress these two arguments on it. So it will be at some specific point in, 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 in my box here, or so in infinite position space, uh, it will at one particular time, but, but the conditions sort of obviously only act on the velocities. And so I'm in the following issue, so suppressing uh, the velocities. And, um, and um, what I want to do is I want to write down a weight equation for this velocity. So, so basically I'm saying, okay, so we have a standard weight equation, so I'm integrating all these uh, velocities, and then there will be a kernel uh, which tells me how much is scattered from V into V prime. Um, so I yeah, used to do computation how much is scattered from V prime into V. And so, so, so this will give me the gate term. So if I'm asking myself, you know, uh, how, uh, uh, how is this function increase? I mean, uh, with a given velocity, then uh, there must be a collision which sort of has generated this velocity. So, so this would be the gain term. Okay. And then there will be the corresponding loss term, which where I have to interchange the argument of these things. And then also. Okay. Okay, so this tells me uh, uh, if, if I'm in velocity v, how much I'm going to lose in transitions from v to v. So this is at that stage sort of like like an assumption. So it looks rather natural that, that you're trying to sort of have such a kernel. And uh, and uh, uh, I mean, you know, if you would sort of think sort of like like a single particle evolution, then it would sort of correspond to sort of you know particle sort of after Poisson waiting time sort of uh, going random collisions. So, so this sort of looks like a rather natural thing to do. Okay. And now, in order to, to get an equation, I mean, you, you better think about what happens to this uh, kernel, right? So uh, now we have to do uh, uh, some computation, which, which I'm going to suppress. And, and uh, Mario, fortunately, this morning, I mean, he, he uh, explained some of these computations, so I will, will not repeat this. But the main observation, of course, is that, that, um, that, uh, that the k <coughs> itself is linear in time. Uh, linear in f, so linear in f. Okay. So uh, sometimes people call this a, a nonlinear arc of jump process. Um, you see, I mean, this if, if, I, if I would give you a fixed kernel, I mean, then this would be sort of a standard arc of jump process in the velocities, right? I mean, so uh, I mean, let's say for fixed uh, for fixed x now, right? But uh, uh, now you realize that actually it's nonlinear, so so people think of this as a nonlinear arc of process. I mean, this this uh, I remember that when I first saw this, I. Found this a very good idea, but on the technical level, it doesn't seem to help. I mean, you, you really have to somehow fight. So, if, if you want to sort of study this equation, you somehow testify this this, uh, this nonlinearity and sort of, to sort, of, sort of consider this as something which you know, if f would be given as something linear, it doesn't seem to help very much. Any case, so this is what you have to do, and um, uh, I don't want to sort of uh, say too much on this, but um, I want to sort of point out one very, I mean, at least to me, very important thing. You see, the f which we introduced over here just counts the number of particles in some region which is sort of very large on the microscopic scale. Now, if you want to compute these kernels, this refers to two particles really being next to each other. So, you know, this, this f as written, if I just take this definition of my f, would be just completely useless. It just doesn't tell you anything about what's happening to this kernel. However, I have to remember that you know that by this law of large numbers, I, ha I have much more structure. What I know is that in a small volume, I actually have a Poisson distribution. 
Now, of course, you know, I, I proposed this initially. I mean, that's sort of not a big deal, but somehow the claim would be that, you know, if I'm going to look at much, much longer times, again, locally, I will still see a Poisson distribution. That's, of course, something which has to be proved. I mean, it's sort of not, not obvious at all. But it can be proved, and, uh, and uh, you know, for the sake of the argument, we simply assume that at some later time, you know, the, the edge still has the same meaning. It's not only the microscopy, but it's also sort of, you know, this, this thing of local products. Well, once, once you assume this, then, of course, it's not so very hard. I mean, you have sort of, you know, if time goes this way, you have sort of two types of collision. Uh, so, so you have here your hard spheres, which are colliding, and um, you have to, so you want to scatter into, so, so you want to scatter into V, I mean, so this is your V prime initially, you want to gain, I mean, so you scatter into V, and then, of course, you need to speak a partner from which you scatter, which is sort of, let's say, the V1, um, and that's the V1 prime and scattered into V1, okay, so, so you, you have to, you, you have to start, you know, imagining that, that, that you know that these sort of incoming velocities are actually independent according to the prescription and according to our Poisson distribution. And then on that basis, I mean, you can sort of compute what is the kernel in this, in this rate equation, right? And uh, the same thing you do for the other one. I mean, you just have to sort of basically inverse, I mean, this, this picture here. So here you have um, um, uh, particles which go like this. I mean, so you want to uh, sort of move out of this particular velocity, this is V, and then you scatter into V prime. So T is moving up or something like backward. And then you have here, um, um, you have here your, your second partner, which is V1, and then it's, this is V1. Now, of course, for this, you have to sort of use the mechanical equations of motion. But uh, it's just a two particle collision. That's something which can be done. And out of this, you get the kinetic equation. I mean, the same one which, which uh, Mario has done this morning, of course, the same one which everybody in this audience, since it's a sort of a Workshop in kinetic equations, so, so this is the uh, kinetic Boltzmann um, equation. It's 1872, when we wrote it down. He actually wanted first, first for the energies, and then later on you realize that it's better if you find it uh, sort of directly for the velocities. So there's this minus v dot the flow term. And then uh, 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 if you sort of do it sort of Carefully and with fixed n, I mean, then, then you have sort of this parameter in square a in front. So this was this was in our scaling. This is actually 51. So I mean, maybe I just leave this out. I mean, it's just more confusing. And so I get integral over r three here for your partner velocities. Uh, then uh, uh, so I have to draw again this this uh, two hard spheres, and then there's no, uh, the unit vector omega hat. This goes from the center of, let's say, sphere 1 to sphere 2. Okay, and here are the incoming, okay, so here are the velocities which are incoming. Okay. All right, and then uh, uh, you could do an integral over the whole sphere, this is about S2 here, the omega hat. And then uh, it's uh, the rate. Uh, one. And now I put here a plus sign here, which means that I'm only looking at incoming velocity. So, uh, um, okay, if I fix these two arguments, I mean, then you have to, have to choose the omega. I mean, this vector, which sort of, this is the omega here, right? The, the vector which gives you how the two spheres touch in such a way that this product is actually positive. Okay? Well, and then you have the, the, the normal thing. I mean, the f of, of x of v1 prime and x of v prime on this f of uh, x and v1 f of x mm. Okay, so that's the famous Boltzmann equation and I should point out that uh, this equation actually holds not only for hard spheres it holds whenever you can sort of properly define what you call by v, v1 and v1, v prime and v1 prime so if I take a smooth potential and if I take a finite range potential, then you know there will be there will be uh, uh, particles will be colliding, and of course then the trajectory sort of look somewhat curved like this maybe, mm -hmm. but but eventually you know they will move straight, and therefore um, you know you know what, what what I mean by 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 incoming velocities. I mean this this is sort of you know when these two particles are still moving, we hope because before they feel any force between each other. 
And then there's some, could be maybe more, slightly more complicated motion, but anyway, there's some motion where they interact, and then if I wait, then, you know, so according to scattering here, if I wait long enough, I will get certain outgoing velocities, and it's of course the same equation. Yes, I I'm just confused maybe because of all your primes and P signs. So what is P1 prime in this equation? Well, I mean, it's sort of, uh, okay. that's a good question. I mean, but, but uh, you know, I mean, there's a lot of invariance in this equation. This is sort of how it's sort of written. Uh, I mean, so, so the way I put this here is that the, the, the V and V1 are incoming velocities and V1 prime and V5 prime. I mean, just about the equation because, I mean, what, I mean, if I would, so to compute it, I mean, how would I? Mean, so how would I compute? I mean, so, so if, I, if, I, if, I, if I give you, if I give you V1, and so, so this, this is, I mean, the V is on, on the right hand side, so the V argument is fixed, right? I mean, so this argument so, is fixed. Okay, I mean the V1 is sort of the argument over which I integrate. So, so this yes, is sort of part understand. of this integration. But the V1 prime and V1 prime and the V prime, I mean, you have to compute according to the collision rule. Right? <coughs> so this morning you have negative. Okay, so this morning you have not going to survive. And then, and if I if I have sort of uh, you know a smooth potential, then of course you know this would be slightly more complicated. So, so, of so this of this one is a function, function of V1 yeah, prime and V prime is a function of V1 and V. In the <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, of course, also, yeah, no, I have to tell you, you know, how hard is that, you know, how hard is this sort of right? Or well, in, in the case of, of these particles, I mean, you know, the omega would be sort of the point of minimal distance between the two particles, huh? and so, um, so let's see what I have to say here, yeah, okay. Um, uh, yeah, okay, now, now I want to say one, one thing here, uh, uh, I mean, this is maybe, maybe the session with sort of uh, Mentioned this in the last lecture a little bit with more care, but but you see can you can see one problem already, uh, and you can also see why hard spheres are particularly uh, sort of convenient in order to study the kinetic limit. You see, I, I draw it like this, uh, but but this of course a little bit of an illusion because you will have also trajectories like basic collisions where the collision time is actually infinite. You know, it takes a very you know they sort of so, sort of the, the collision time is not bounded. And so you see that, that, that the, now, now you might become sort of a little bit worried about your, your whole scheme because it's not uniform in the collision time, right? And so you have to really worry about this. The hard sphere sort of uh, have this unique property that the collision time is strictly equal to zero, right? I mean, you go through incoming and instantaneously to go to the output. And so, so, so this is a, an enormous simplification. That's why the first proof was given for hard spheres and, and, and only, you know, took, took quite some time until one understood the case of, of uh, let's say, finite range two potentials. It's much more difficult than the hot sphere case. <coughs> so now let's see. Ah, okay. So we still have a few minutes. So, so I do maybe, maybe one thing uh, because everybody is so tired already. Something which of course you know, but but. Uh, uh, no, I, uh, I think you know it's such a lecture. I mean, since everyone one has to, to mention this. Of course, there's you know all kind of beautiful things about the Boltzmann equation, but but there's sort of one one thing. Which, uh, which, when it was first discovered, immediately convinced uh, the people, I mean, people had some understanding of the whole subject, that you know, this equation has to be correct, I mean, independent of you know, any further argument. And that's, of course, a uh, famous entropy increase. And so let me put this uh, uh, as, as the last item for today. I mean, so we have 2.3 entropy increase. And so let me do this sort of uh, for the spatially homogeneous case. So, uh, so homogeneous case, uh, namely, uh, uh, you know, when, when you simply drop the excipient, it's just sort of uh, a low density gas, which is basically completely uniform, but the velocities have some distribution, which is certainly not the next value. And then uh, you can look at, uh, at the, the entropy. So, uh, of course, you, you can look also at the, at the H function, but that, uh, we sort of like to use the term entropy because it's sort of uh, tells you that it's between nothing else but it's entropy. Okay. And, uh, well, then you can, of course, uh, uh, if you assume that you have solutions to the equation, which in the spatial homogeneous case is actually a very well understood subject. <coughs> I mean, you, you can uh, so do a little manipulation with, with all these integrals. And um, 
So you still have your vertical, but you get another velocity integral because I have to integrate over the function. Right? I mean, so then there's your, the, the omega hat, uh, so this goes over S2, here's the omega hat. Uh, let me see, I put now V1 minus V2 uh, plus, okay. And uh, so allow me to sort of put this over here. And uh, well, then, then after some manipulations, I mean, you find sort of you know this this thing uh, that this is. Um, okay. This is the and then you get the log, and you get the same thing. So I mean, f of u one prime, f of v two prime, divided by f of v one. Okay. And now, now you realize that this thing is greater equal to zero, and therefore the entropy is increasing. And then uh, uh, you might wonder what happens to the stationary solution. So then, uh, presumably, you know, the entropy will not change anymore. <coughs> so you might ask yourself. So, so this is this is what is usually called the entropy production. So, so this is sigma of f entropy production. Okay, so you might ask yourself what happens to the, to the solution of sigma f equal to zero. So that should be sort of the stationary case. And, and now you look look at, at, at this equation, and it, it turns out that uh, it's actually you know you might think you want to make this zero, but that's not so easy. So you, you try to make this zero. So you define a function psi, which is called the collision invariant, which is the log I mean, psi of e, which is the log of f of e. And then you look at, 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 this, at, at this quantity, and then you see that you get a, a funny looking equation. <coughs> so you're looking for an unknown function <coughs> which has to satisfy this identity where the v1 and v2 are related to a hard straight collision, or maybe to you know, such kind of. Uh, um, uh, interaction with this most potential to v1 prime v2 prime. And now you're asking what, you know, can you identify what are these functions? No, 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 of course, Boltzmann uh, did this. Uh, sorry, we should ask you the question, but to me it looks like it, the logarithm is zero and also the two factor is zero. What is, what is zero? I mean, I mean, because the equation for logarithm to be zero is, is just with the two factors equal to zero. No, no, I mean, so I want to have this, this. Yeah, I understand, but you said so, you so I make this, this factor, I want to have this factor equal to zero, right? But what do you put which from? This, this, the, this whole, the log of this thing. Yeah, but then the loss would be factor zero. Yes. What is zero? No, I no, no, so I define, I define this function by log of zero. Yeah, but it's, 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 but because you said it's so difficult to make it. No, no, no. Well, I mean, you can also look at this. Doesn't make any difference. But the, but the point is that that uh, mathematics is sort of seems to be that particular equation sort of more accessible than the other one. We're looking for an unknown function psi on 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 R three in such a way that that under all collisions this particular sum will hold. What kind of functions do you get? Yeah. No, okay. it's the same <laughs> <laughs> but you cannot, when it, a minus b is equal to zero, it must say a divided by b is equal to one. That's sort of, I mean, no, it's the same thing. I mean, it's the same thing. It doesn't matter. It's yeah, okay. So, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, so, so now, Boltzmann <laughs> realized already, Boltzmann realized already that, that, that the solution to this equation is psi of the equal to the constant function. But this, everybody would have guessed. And then, uh, you know, there's sort of a linear function, and then there's also... Mm -hmm. now, of course, you know, if you plug it in, I mean, you just use the conservation laws and, and, and figure out that, uh, that this, this choice for psi will satisfy this equation, right? I mean, this is just a constant, and then conservation momentum, conservation of energy, so this part is real. But, but the other one is sort of non-trivial. I mean, make sure that there's no other function. And then it becomes actually an interesting mathematical question, you know. When, when you talk about no other functions, I mean, what kind of functions do you actually allow? I mean, you know, do they have to be three times differentiable, or, you know, what kind of functions do you actually look at? Right? Anyway, so I just want to say that, 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 that Boltzmann did this, but when you look at his proof, I mean, you realize that he very heavily uses the fact that you have a kinetic energy which goes like, like one-half e squared, 
and you have a very explicit rule of collision. Right? And so, so, you know, it's a, a simple, simple formula which tells you, you know, how, how the how the v, uh, I mean, the v and v prime, I mean, the v one prime and v two prime are given in terms of v one and v two. Okay? So, what about uh, uh, what about uh, a dispersion relation? What about relativistic particles? Where instead of v squared, you have a one over. Okay? So, this is what Chachiniani, so a very beautiful paper, where we started to investigate. Now, you come to wave equations. Now, when you come to wave equations, you know, it still has a sort of rather similar structure. So there's also the issue of collision invariance. But now the collision between waves is, is a, it's a much more difficult object. And so it becomes a sort of non trivial question to actually understand these kind of situations. Okay? So maybe in the last lecture, the last of my lectures, I will explain a little bit more about this. Okay, so I guess that's a good time to stop here, because the next chapter is sort of something really in addition that gives me a few minutes to answer some of Anton's questions. <laughs> <laughs>